Good evening, everyone. Małgorzata Bonikowska, the Center for International Relations, Poland. Uh, welcome at this uh, uh, Tuesday talk. We do it every Tuesday to discuss the world, the situation in Europe. Um, the title is Zoom the World, and we do this series with the Konrad Adenauer Foundation. And today we speak English because the topic is about Brexit, something which we really feel now happening because the transition period is over. Uh, the UK is out of the European Union, and we would like to discuss uh, what it means for Europe, for the UK, but also for the Republic of Ireland, which no doubt was very worried about this process, and it's maybe the most affected out of all the EU member states. So welcome, uh, gentlemen. We have two uh, speakers today who are really the best for such discussion. Let me welcome first our guest from Dublin, Bobby McDonough. Hi, Bobby. Hi there. Uh, I'm delighted to have you with us, and thank you for agreeing for this talk. Um, uh, Mr. McDonough was actually a, a, a diplomat, an Irish diplomat, uh, for many years with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. He was a permanent representative of Ireland to the European Union. He was the Irish ambassador to uh, Italy, but also to the UK uh, and Malaysia. And um, also he worked in Brussels. He knows Brussels quite well, uh, working with two Irish uh, EU commissioners and also in the European Parliament. So I hope you will let us, you will help us to understand what uh, Brexit means for the Irish. And the second speaker is Professor Wawrzyniec Konarski. Dzień dobry, Wawrzyniec. Dzień dobry, good afternoon. Uh, Wawrzyniec is uh, my colleague from the Vistula University in Warsaw. Um, he's rector of this university, but um, uh, as far as his academic profile, he is a specialist, an expert on Ireland, first of all, especially Northern Ireland. And he also um, wrote several books, not only on this country, but also on uh, different uh, you know, places in Europe, uh, different problems in Europe as well, concerning local conflict, uh, regional and nationalistic movements. So, Wawrzyniec, um, uh, I hope you will help us to understand um, not only how we Europeans see Brexit, but also what is your understanding, what is happening now in Ireland, UK, and especially Northern Ireland. First question would go to Bobby, um, Your Excellency, as a former diplomat. Uh, could you tell us actually how the Irish took Brexit when it started? And what is this process? What does this mean for you? Well, I'm delighted to join you today, Michael Sata. Thank you for inviting me. Um, the first thing to say is that there's political consensus in Ireland about Brexit. There's not political consensus about many things, but right across the political spectrum, the view is that Brexit is a mistake. Uh, we know that there are many people in the UK perhaps half the people there who, who would disagree with me. But in Ireland, uh, we all approach Brexit and have approached it with sadness and regret. It's going to pose problems for Ireland, um, for our farmers, for our traders. Uh, it's also not good for the European Union because Britain was a very important member and helped significantly to shape the European Union, including being an advocate for the early enlargement of the Union to include Poland. Uh, it's not good for the UK either, in our view. We think it will not be good for the UK economically or in terms of its influence. Uh, it's not good for British-Irish relations and it's not good for the delicate peace process in Northern Ireland. So basically, uh, as the European Union has said all along, there are no winners from Brexit. But that sadness, if you like, is tempered by the fact that we now have a trade deal. Um, it's a minimalist trade deal, but it's a lot better than not having one. We also have the Northern Ireland Protocol as part of the withdrawal agreement, which ensures that there will be no, uh, no controls and no, no new border on the island of Ireland, which is very important. And, and having that minimal trade deal uh, and also the Northern Ireland Protocol means that we have a basis for improving relations in future. If we had a complete rupture without a deal, we would have gone into a downward spiral. But now we can go into whatever the opposite of a downward spiral is uh, and hopefully when things settle down and perhaps future British governments will want a closer relationship with the European Union, I'm sure that a Labour government would immediately rejoin Erasmus, for example, so that students can continue to enjoy those, each other's universities. So um, we're sad, but we think it could be worse. 
uh, we're going through COVID now, which in many ways is, is more shocking and more dramatic, but COVID will pass, you know, within a year or at most 18 months, COVID will be, will be history, whereas Brexit uh, will be the future. This is also so, a good thing in this moment, just to stress that the, despite Brexit, um, still, you know, the European countries, the European Union countries and the Brussels institutions also tried to still work with the UK as far as, you know, the vaccination process and coordination of all these efforts to fight pandemic. Um, before we go into details of the deal, I want to um, move to Vavzhinets uh, or Lokan, how you, you can, we can call you. Um, can you tell us, because you are neutral in this process, you are a Polish scholar who um, specializes in, in, in Ireland, uh, but also who sees this situation from the distance. You are a political scientist, you are a historian. Uh, what do you, how could you describe the consequences of this process, this breakup, which no one is happy about in Europe, for uh, both UK and Ireland? I think it's, uh, first of all, again, uh, thank you for the invitation for taking part in this uh, very interesting afternoon. I'm, I'm very much pleased to be here with all of you. And uh, uh, in reference to the, to the question just posed, I think that uh, there are several levels in which you have to identify some uh, future consequences of a decision called Brexit. And uh, let me remind that the Brexit as a term has been invented already in 2012 but uh, by, by uh, Peter Wilding, uh, and it has become afterwards uh, a, a typical sort of the uh, description or abbreviation of the process, which has been initiated in a very misfortunate way by uh, former British Prime Minister, uh, David Cameron, whom I uh, definitely and totally blame for the initiation of this process, because in fact, it was very intentional uh, made by him, but of course, his intention was not to leave you, uh, EU, but to measure his popularity and leadership within the Tories party. And he went too far, simply speaking, was not able to, uh, unable to think what might be the consequences of this uh, announcement uh, in regard to the debate about such process uh, like Brexit became to be known since uh, 2003. Uh, 12. But it seems that the, the British public opinion didn't really change since then. I mean, there are still, you know, those who support strongly Brexit and believe in... The I'm coming, right. definitely. Yes, you're right. But it is very closely uh, identified with the divisions within the society. And if I see any levels of the consequences of the Brexit, I can see three of them mostly. These are economic, political and psychological. And in terms of the economy, as we know, and again, coming back to your question, we might say that, of course, in the so-called provincial Britain, there is a great support for the Brexit idea. However, within the younger generation, people living uh, and having very good ties to the rest of Europe, there is a great disagreement for the process initiated by the Tory party. That's one thing. And the Tory party and common decision has been afterwards followed by the uh, involvement of such controversial politicians Within the, within the British uh, political stage, like Nigel Farage, who speaks excellent English, but who is really a sort of the uh, controversial adventurer. I like his style of talking English, but there's only one thing which I like in his uh, uh, political profile. And frankly speaking, I think that uh, economic uh, level is identified with the, as I said, great disagreement of the younger generations, people from the, let's say, London city, who were already involved in the uh, most important uh, economic exchange or financial exchange with the rest of Europe. In terms of the politics, these consequences which might be coming are also very important and they definitely uh, show to the British, Polish, British public opinion that uh, Brexit might be a very dangerous process which has been just initiated, a process uh, understood as the danger for the internal cohesiveness of British, of British state of the United Kingdom in terms of the ethno-national lines and in terms of the interest of those communities which do have right now their own national, uh, national interest. I'm having, of course, in mind, uh, especially Scots, Scotsmen, uh, Northern Irish, and uh, to much lesser extent, Welshmen. 
But anyway, I think that from the political point of view and from the point of view of the cohesiveness of the uh, British state, it is a real danger for the segmentation of, uh, of United Kingdom. And the third level, which is, I call it as a psychological one, refers to the issue that people are really much, very much frustrated. Those who are active, who are oriented into the professionalism, who are unsatisfied with the problems which may arise quite soon with the exchange of students, with the exchange of the capital, exchange of the trade. Uh, this is something which makes people frustrated and which may have also some psychologically based consequences. This is my presumption in terms of the British public opinion. So you mentioned three areas. Maybe, Bobby, you could react on that. Let me start with political question, because it's a very important one. And Vavzhenets made a very, uh, very radical statement saying that Brexit can influence the uh, integrity of the, the UK. Uh, what is your perception? You were the Irish ambassador to the UK. You know this country very well. Uh, would you expect the further development towards you know, the referendum, another referendum in Scotland? And what about Northern Ireland? Well, I think the professor is, is right that the UK is divided on the issue of Brexit. Uh, I think they're going to get on with it now. They're out. They're not going to have another referendum in the foreseeable future. But the form of Brexit that was chosen by the British government was quite a hard form of Brexit. It was not a step towards the other side of the, the argument in the UK. If you then look at, at Scotland, um, the Scottish National Party is already by far the largest party in Scotland and there's an election coming up soon and Scotland voted by a significant majority against Brexit. So being pulled out of the European Union against their will, out of Erasmus, for example, I've mentioned already, but with Scottish people losing many of their employment rights and, and residence rights and so on, um, it's clearly going to add to the case for uh, Scottish independence. So, I mean, I'm not, as a former mm -hmm. Irish representative in London go to take a view on that, but just objectively speaking, it is going to increase the arguments in favour of Scottish independence and we have to see where that plays out because Scottish people are comfortable with the dual identity in the same way that Irish people are and, and Polish people are. To see the Irish flag flying beside the European flag is something we're extremely comfortable with. Uh, it's The Scottish people are comfortable with, with it as well, so they're not happy with where they are, but it's entirely a matter for them uh, and for the United Kingdom as a whole to work out uh, their future. Northern Ireland, we're much more closely involved in because um, Ireland is a co-guarantor of the peace process in Northern Ireland. And again, the majority in Northern Ireland, most of the Catholic nationalists, but a significant number of unionists and also the almost the entire business community voted against Brexit. Uh, and they are now finding themselves with similar uh, impact on their identity uh, being pulled out of out of the European Union. So I think it makes people uh, less comfortable uh, being part of the United Kingdom. But having said that, there is there are a very significant number of people who entirely legitimately unionists who want to remain part of the United Kingdom. But Brexit doesn't help their argument. Well, we have a question from the floor. Let me quote it. Uh, do you think Brexit will lead or will make possible the future you know, unification of the island one day? Well, I think that the issue of the future unification of the island is already an issue on the agenda. It hasn't been resolved because in the Good Friday Agreement signed up to by the two governments and the political parties in Northern Ireland, it is provided that the British government is obliged to hold a referendum if it appears that a majority in Northern Ireland want Irish unity. So it's not like Scotland. It's not a matter of being in the gift of the London government. They're legally obliged to do that. And the population of Northern Ireland is changing. So the number of, if you like, Catholics is going up and Protestants going down. And, uh, and we also saw a majority, if you like, voting against the, the, the majority of unionist opinion in the Brexit referendum. So it, it's already an issue on the agenda. Brexit does, um, further add fuel to that agenda. But having said that, there's an agree agreement being reached, which I can explain in detail if you like, but Northern Ireland, while leaving the European Union with the rest of the United Kingdom and remaining part of the United Kingdom for many purposes, including the European uh, single market in services, but for the single market in goods, it will in effect 
remain part of the European Union. And in some ways that brings Northern Ireland closer to the European Union, but in another way, it, it is not stoking up the case for Irish unity. If Northern Ireland had left and a border had to be introduced on the island of Ireland because Northern Ireland was leaving the common market for goods, that would have really uh, turbocharged uh, the arguments for Irish unity. So I think having an arrangement that doesn't unsettle the relationships on the island of Ireland, um, it's not, it, it doesn't land the issue of Irish unity on the table, which was there already, uh, but it, it, uh, it, it's an additional factor there, but population change um, remains a significant factor as well. And I'd also say like the basis of the Good Friday Agreement in 1998 was a respect for both traditions, for both sets of aspirations equally. So people were entitled to, uh, to want to remain part of the United Kingdom and unless a majority wanted to change that would remain, but also they were entitled to develop the All-Ireland dimension, entitled indeed legally entitled to a referendum if a majority wanted it. And the European Union has agreed in the Brexit negotiations that if Northern, if Northern Ireland does join the rest of Ireland, it will automatically become part of the European Union. So there will be no need for a new negotiation as there would with Scotland. So let me ask you in the, at this moment, let, let me move into uh, Virginia for a moment, but uh, let me come back to this um, question of uh, the perception and the you know the future of the situation in Ireland because I understand from what you said that definitely implementing a border would have been much worse solution so in this sense uh, the, the agreement reached in, is somehow a compromise which at least uh, allows the people in the island to to to, to stay in, uh, you know peaceful However, it's also uh, one step towards further changes. Uh, Vavrzinets, you spent years on uh, research on Northern Ireland issue, and you know very well, you know, the Good Friday Agreement, everything, every single detail. How do you see this, uh, this situation now? Uh, when we don't have a border, but we have this strange fact that Northern Ireland it's in custom union with the European Union as far as goods. So in a way, Boris Johnson agreed on something Theresa May didn't want to agree, to have a kind of an internal border within two parts of the UK. Boris Johnson is sort of the stubborn realist and, and he's trying, of course, to uh, withdraw certain conclusions from some of the decisions he has made already before. Uh, but I, I, I think he is a politician who went in some of the some of the segments uh, definitely too far. But I think that if you allow me, uh, I would like to remind some important facts from the Irish history, and uh, in fact, the Irish British history. First of all, uh, I mean, uh, Ambassador McDonough is absolutely right when he is recalling the uh, requirement that only the majority of the society in Northern Ireland may decide what might be the final decision of the status of the SOFA province of United Kingdom, but it has been prepared in some of the documents over the, in the 20s and in 1973. Uh, those documents, uh, the first one that was omitted into the parliament of Northern Ireland, the second one on the majority of the population. Uh, this is one thing, and uh, uh, Mr. Ambassador is absolutely right when he's saying that the uh, number of Catholics is rising, and it may have a definite uh, a definite, uh, uh, it may help to make the final decision after some years, definitely not now. Secondly, we have to bear in mind that unification of Ireland is the uh, sort of the basic point in the program of all of the serious and most important and historical Irish political parties, including Fianna Foy, including Fianna, 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 Fianna Gael, and of course, even Sinn Féin. Sinn Féin was not, of course, before. Uh, perceived as the as the serious party, but of course, for more than 20 years, it is as such. And the North Street Party, no, no Irish party has resigned from this argumentation, from this postulate in the programs and, man, and party manifestos. This is also very important. And another third issue, which we have to remind is the declaration of the Downing Street from 1993, when for the first time in the Irish-British relations history, then Prime Minister, uh, John Major, together with the Irish Prime Minister, Mr. Reynolds, they already uh, came to the conclusion that Britain does not have any further selfish interest as far as the 
uh, as the as Ireland is concerned, Ireland understood uh, mm, as the entire Ireland, but especially Northern Ireland as a province of Britain, which gave a certain certain free chance to renegotiate of the status in the predictable future and with the consent of all of the sides involved, namely Catholics and Protestants in Northern Ireland, Irish government and British government. This is very important declaration has been made 27 years ago, which I'm afraid uh, to a very large extent has been undermined by some of the decisions undertaken before by Boris Johnson. And that's why it is really okay that finally some uh, decisions were uh, recently undertaken like this, um, uh, like 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 the the status of the, uh, for instance, the trade area uh, between Ireland and uh, Northern Ireland. By the way, um, if I if I'm using the term Republic of Ireland, I'm absolutely aware of the fact that this is not the constitutional name, because Ireland is not a republic, in terms of the constitutional meaning, is area still, and this is the official name of the country. Uh, declared in 1937 constitution. And as De Valera said once, the Republic as the official name of, the, of Ireland will be finally decided if Ireland is unified. So Republic more or less is uh, rather the technical word, a word which is the uh, not uh, prime, not pristine, but the secondary source of the law adopted in 1949 in a separate act of the Irish Parliament, and uh, coming back to the to the issue and uh, coming to the conclusion, I think that uh, the unification of Ireland as the entire island is the is a process which is uh, absolutely unavoidable. But it is a evolutionary, and I hope not revolutionary process. That's why the fact that the uh, Good Friday Agreement has been undersigned. Uh, made uh, or was in fact a sort of the precedence, very reasonable, very, very uh, clever, and uh, based on some of the uh, some of the previous mistakes uh, committed by very many sides involved in the conflict, a decision which gave the chance to reconciliate the uh, communities and also to open new chances for the exchange of uh, trade issues of the education and also of uh, having been more, more uh, connected family to family. This was something which was absolutely important and those 22 years which are behind us uh, are showing to what extent people may be conciliatory to each other. That's why Brexit is a wrong thing from this point of view. Well, could, I, um, could I just add to um, the Professor's um, historical perspective just to add, I mean, the British and Irish governments have worked very, very closely together uh, to achieve peace in Northern Ireland. And it is, I'm absolutely sure, the wish both of the government in London and the government of Dublin to continue to do so. And a very important uh, factor in all of this is that Irish nationalism has accepted for a long time now that the only unity worth having is a unity of people. Indeed. It's not a unity of territory brought about by violence. The vast majority of people in Ireland were opposed to the terrorism of the latter part of the 20th century. So for, for that reason, um, the current government, which is of more, if you like, Republican nationalist tradition than, than some others might be, um, it has established a unit, a shared island unit in the Prime Minister's office to discuss how we are going to share our island. And our current Taoiseach Prime Minister does not talk explicitly about Irish unity, he talks about a shared Ireland. And I think a lot of people support him in that because a unity that is imposed or rammed down people's throats is not going to be unity at all. So it's, it's an extraordinarily delicate and difficult um, thing to manage. But what we have to do is to recognize the aspirations of both communities. And in the same way that uh, we argued that the nationalist community was for a long time disrespected in Northern Ireland, we absolutely must not make the same mistake of not respecting the unionist community in Northern Ireland. So, so some time is going to be required and some serious thinking is going to be required because if one day there is Irish unity, we in Ireland are going to have to respect Britishness. We're going to have to respect the Union Jack in the same way that we expected uh, the United Kingdom to respect Irish nationalism in Northern Ireland. So these are, these are pretty tricky questions and it's going to take some time. 
But it's very good that you mentioned that, and I also wanted to uh, quote a question from the from the audience here from uh, Sylvia Lewandowska, who is asking about this British Irish relations and also people to people contact. Would you expect that the Brexit will worsen it? Because somehow, you know, under the European Union, Irish and the Brits were, I mean, in one union. Now they are on the other side. It may affect the, 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 the relations between these two nations. Look, Ireland and the United Kingdom have probably got as great and as long a historical rivalry as any other two countries in the world. Uh, and that history was quite tragic at times. Uh, but over recent decades, we have become very close friends, culminating in the visit of the British Queen to Ireland in 2011, the first visit by a British monarch to an independent Ireland, where she was welcomed very warmly, very, very warmly indeed. And the context for that growing friendship between our two countries was the European Union. I sat around tables with British colleagues for 30 years. I saw how influential they were, how traditionally sympathetic they were to Irish issues, how they understood us, how we so often worked together. We often differed as well. Um, but before the modern troubles started in Northern Ireland, British ministers and Irish ministers, British civil servants, Irish civil servants didn't know each other. But over the nearly half century of British Irish membership, we became friends. We had a shared context for uh, for, for solving difficulties or for pursuing shared objectives. And unfortunately, that is gone. So the will is very much still there on the Irish side, as I'm sure it is on the British side, to maintain that friendship. But the context for the friendship is now much more difficult because we're not sitting around the same table. So we're going to have to work much harder at it. And unfortunately, the whole relationship is going to have to be seen for some time through the prism of Brexit. Um, we're not just one inside the European Union and the other not, but we have different ways of perceiving the world. We're set on different courses. We take, for example, the, uh, the British insistence on sovereignty in the context of the Brexit negotiations. They're perfectly entitled to do that. But I can tell you for certain that Ireland is every bit as attached to its sovereignty. After all, we had to struggle for it for a long time as the British are. And we, the both. we are very similar to the Irish, I guess, as far as we this. understand sovereignty in a completely different way. We believe that sovereignty is not something to be hidden away from the light, but sovereignty is something to be used to develop trade agreements, to develop partnerships with our with our friends in Europe. Similarly, and I just give this as an example of how we think differently now from the post Brexit Britain going global. Going global is a big thing for Britain, and I wish them every luck. But for Ireland, going global is as a first step being part of the most extraordinary uh, grouping of free democratic countries in the world. It doesn't hinder in the slightest degree our desire to trade with China or India. In fact, it helps us as it used to help the United Kingdom. So I, I just say that uh, uh, if you are to illustrate that we, we really have a different way of looking at the world and Ireland has taken various steps towards psychological independence. We won our independence a century ago, but then joining the European Union, uh, the break with sterling as a currency, uh, joining the euro. These were all steps towards Ireland's psychological independence. But I think the biggest step has been Brexit, uh, where Ireland, although we're affected by Brexit more than anyone and our farmers and our business people are affected, we are, I would say, entirely unaffected by the Brexit arguments. Even though we get the British media, the British tabloids, but the sort of arguments made by Nigel Farage, driven initially for years by Nigel Farage, they have zero impact in Ireland. And I'd like just finally to talk about the people to people thing. This is really, really important because one of the great richnesses of the British Irish relationship is the number of uh, Irish people who have contributed to Britain and who increasingly the British people who contribute in Ireland. In fact, there's a, a series on BBC Four Radio now on Monday nights about the Irish contribution to Britain, which it used to be said that earlier in the 20th century that the Irish in Britain nursed the sick, built the roads and taught the children. And that was true, but now they run the IT companies and write the plays. I mean, every aspect of life Ireland has contributed. But it works the other way too. We have an increasing number of British people living in Ireland. In fact, last year, for the first time in history, more people moved from Britain to Ireland than from Ireland to Britain, despite the long history of emigration. And those British people are coming to Ireland to do every sort of job. I come across them everywhere and they're extraordinarily welcome. And because of our cultural closeness, they blend in very well. So that, that people to people thing is something that will not be affected by Brexit and will remain a fundamental building block in the British-Irish relationship. We are also following this people-to-people -people relations because, as, as everybody knows, polls now are 
the biggest majority uh, in the UK, uh, after enlargement, uh, more than 1 million people, 700,000 decided to stay. They registered in the system and they are happy. I mean, they stay despite the Brexit. Vavzhenyets, from your opinion, um, what could be the consequence of Brexit for the European Union from our continental perspective? Um, not only Polish, but generally speaking, you know, the union's perspective. Do you think this process, this exit, could bring us further into a deeper integration or on the other way around? It will be an example of an exit that can we can repeat. I think the Brexit is the is a lesson for both sides, for those who are skeptical, who are skeptics, and for those who are Euro enthusiasts, and uh, but let me also uh, add a few, just a few words about what has been said already by, by, by Mr. Ambassador, because I absolutely believe that the unific, if I use the term unification, I have in mind the unification of people. This way, Brexit is wrong because Brexit uh, is more or less a danger for keeping these ties which have been developed in the last twenty years, and this is dangerous also because as like the some of the specialists in political sciences in Ireland and in Britain speculated already that if there will be a so-called uh, a strong border or hard border between Ireland and Northern Ireland, then it may be also the basis for the uh, revitalization of any sort of the radical movements. And this is something which is a danger, a speculative, fortunately, only for, 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 the, for the time being, but still a speculation. And that's why I think that if the unity is, is the, on the spot, uh, and if I'm using the word, I have in mind the, uh, all of the aspects, aspects of the unity between the people, of the chance to exchange the views, exchange the, uh, the, the commons, exchange uh, the, the, the educational uh, uh, of young generations. This is something which definitely is a basis for the chance to overcome all the negative consequences of Brexit, of Brexit towards Ireland, Northern Ireland, and also Britain. And I mean, Your Excellency, you're absolutely right when you say that the people are, are uh, right now from Britain and Ireland, they are quite friendly to one to each, other, to each other, but on the other hand, we have to bear in mind that Brexit from this point of view is a very uh, negative precedence in the contemporary uh, international relations uh, within the EU. And that's why it has to be criticized and be taken as something which should not be uh, repeated again. And that's the question from Algojata. Yes, uh, I'm afraid that the Brexit may have, uh, or may, may, may be perceived as a sort of the encouragement from some of the uh, mm, secessionist like groups within the uh, contemporary European state, especially those states which are unsatisfied with the uh, reached already level of the European unification. As we know, uh, fortunately in Poland, despite the fact that the Polish government is, which is a right-wing government and uh, which represents quite often a sort of the skeptical approach towards EU. And this special, uh, special uh, approach is fortunately not uh, supported by the majority of Poles which is very well visible in terms of different polls. And this is something which we have to bear in mind always whenever we talk about the Polish presence within the EU. But on the other hand, we have to bear in mind that uh, the European Union is quite often perceived also by those who are the enthusiasts of the EU as the oligarchical -like structure, too much bureaucratic, too much oriented into some, some formalities or formal procedures that uh, uh, European Union is the entity which has to be alive, which has to be uh, very dynamic internally, and which requires, of course, first of all, the movement of people. This is something which is unfortunate right now within the COVID circumstances, other the, uh, another danger. And it also may uh, cause some, some skepticism about some of the societies, especially those societies in which you may find quite strongly populist-like movements, or populist-like even governing parties, which is the case of Poland and Hungary, for instance, and uh, which definitely will not make the further process of the European unification uh, an easy one. I personally also do not know what might be the future 
uh, future uh, strategy for the European Union development in order to avoid some of the uh, criticism from those who are Euro-skeptical uh, forces within the EU. I think that it will require also a soft, sort of the internal, internal self-modification or internal self-distance from those who are at the moment uh, the category of people called quite often as Eurocrats. This is something which definitely will require some uh, further steps in order to make European Union as the idea, as a di very dynamic and very revitalized in terms of the crisis which we are facing right now. Uh, Vavzhenyat mentioned that the Polish society is very pro-European. Let me quote the recent opinion polls, which is 88% of the people are happy with being um, within the EU and um, that's a maybe paradox because the government in Poland uh, right now is much more Eurosceptical. Um, same situation is in Hungary. Uh, Bobby, you mentioned that also Irish are very pro-Europeans. However, I have to repeat this question to, to you. You were working in Brussels for many years. What would you expect? What What is your perception of how Brexit affects the European Union and the mindset of, of the not only the bureaucrats, but also the European leaders? I think Europe benefited from the United Kingdom's mem membership. Um, you know, Europe today looks more like the United Kingdom wanted than the French would have wanted 30 years ago, enlarged to 27 now countries. Uh, with an internal market, no United States of Europe. The British diplomats were as good as any others, arguably the best. Um, and the tragedy is that the only people who didn't understand Britain's influence in Europe were the British public, because it wasn't explained to them over many decades. So I regret very much that the UK and its pragmatism is no longer in the European Union. But in some ways, uh, Europe is going to come out strongly from this because the public reaction to Brexit has been very negative. And parties that were skeptical, uh, I mean, I'm not an expert on Polish politics, but um, in Italy, for example, uh, uh, where I was ambassador, uh, the, uh, some of the parties that were skeptical have backed away from the idea of having a referendum on the Euro or possibly wanting to leave the European Union because people see Brexit as being very damaging for the UK. I know the UK and many of them don't see it like that, but there's a pretty wide consensus outside that that is the case. So. I think in that way, also the unity that the European Union showed during the Brexit negotiations was quite remarkable. Uh, and I must pay tribute to the Polish government as well as the other government for supporting Irish concerns in relation to Northern Ireland. Uh, in the beginning, there was no inevitability that we would get the outcome that we did on the withdrawal agreement. And on that and on other issues, the 27 uh, countries that were negotiating with the UK showed remarkable uh, resilience and unity. They started off with really only two red lines. One was to preserve the single market and the other was to avoid a hard border on the island of Ireland. And beyond that, the shape of the deal was largely dictated by the British government and the European Union remained very uh, solid and firm in that. The European Union in 2020 also got on with its agenda. I mean, it, it, it's pursuing uh, the Commission's two priorities of making a greener Europe and the digital agenda where we saw just yesterday Chancellor Merkel taking a very clear stand on Twitter uh, in relation to Trump and saying that it shouldn't be up to Twitter to decide whether Trump does or does not appear on Twitter, but that national governments or in the case of the European Union, the European Union should legislate to, just, to, to, to avoid hate speech and incitement. Uh, so these, these are priorities that the European Union has been getting on with. Also, um, in the recovery uh, package that it agreed, it's it's raising its own uh, uh, borrowing for the first time. So this is a very significant uh, thing. So look, I'd be happier if the UK was still in, but I'm pretty sure that the Euro European Union will remain strong. I think the election of Biden will be very important because Biden is an admirer of the European Union, unlike his predecessor, and Biden also believes in multilateralism. And I'd be pretty mm -hmm. sure that Biden uh, you know, will will prioritize his relationship with Brussels and with the major players in the European Union when it comes to relationships with Europe. Before I move to the question concerning the US, I want to still ask you, Bobby, about one thing, because um, there are many politicians um, of the uh, right wing parties who say that this uh, UK out uh, change the dynamics between the EU member states, that we uh, have really now a domination of Germany 
who now is the strongest, the biggest, the largest economy, the, the biggest population, and this country starts to dominate the, the European Union, using the fact, um, even if the Germans don't want it, but it just happens that France, economically speaking, is weaker, and the UK is out. So uh, some radical um, right politician says that it's no more uh, Europe in Germany, but we are facing uh, German Europe. What is the perception from your, um, uh, your side, not only being a former diplomat, but also, also being Irish? So, you know, Ireland is not the biggest country in Europe, of course. But as you rightly said, you see your sovereignty and your power much stronger within the European Union. Um, what do you think will happen with this fact? Germany well, I, I think this is the, the big country fallacy. The idea that, uh, you know, one big country can take all the decisions. I mean, the, the first thing to say is that Germany doesn't take all of the decisions. And the sort of uh, way that the European Commission pursues individual member states for infringements and breaking European law, they, they, they pursue the Germans every bit as much as they do the other, the other countries. Um, the, the Irish finance minister was elected to be uh, president of the Eurogroup some months ago. Uh, and his election to that was opposed by, if I recall, France, Germany, Italy, and Spain. So the idea that one big country or even the big countries together or a group of big countries together can, can, can decide everything is simply not the case. Then you have to uh, factor in the fact that Germany has always been exceptionally receptive to the views of every country of the European Union. It's very open to Ireland's views. It always has been. I know that because I've worked with them for decades. Um, they're very sensitive to the position of, of small countries and absolutely equal to middle-sized to large countries like Poland, I'm sure, I'm sure is even more the case. So then you also have to, to take account of the, of, of the ethos of the European Union. The European Union does not exist or operate on the basis that one or two small countries sit in a dark room and then come out and announce their verdict. Every day in Brussels, at every level, political level, ambassadorial level, official level, the 27 member states are sitting around the table, uh, negotiating, shaping legislation, deciding foreign policy, and they're doing so in a very respectful way in which everyone's position is taken into account. And the number of times Ireland has been the European Union now for what, 40, 48 years? Um, the number of times we've been outvoted by qualified majority voting is less than 10 in all those years. I couldn't tell you how many times exactly, because the way the European Union works is that you don't just listen to everybody, the small, the middle sized, the large, but you take account of it as well. And if Ireland has a reasonable point or if Poland has a reasonable point, this not just should be taken into account, but is taken into account. So for all those reasons, I absolutely don't, don't buy the idea that <clears throat> Germany is going to call all the shots or dominate the new Europe. Uh, Vavrzhenias, to you, uh, I would have a question concerning also um, the future developments uh, between the UK and the US, um, taking into consideration that we have also an Irish diaspora quite um, you know, active. We Polish people are also um, having a huge diaspora in the United States. Do you think these, um, this plan of the UK of um, stepping into two legs, one in Europe, let's say, being still close, uh, as Boris Johnson always says that UK is a European country, but in the same time building such a special relations with the US first, but also with the Commonwealth countries. Uh, if I remember correctly, 54 uh, countries are in the Commonwealth um, uh, still. How do you visualize the future of this plan? First of all, let me uh, stop for a short while again for this uh, issue of Germany. Uh, Germany issue, I understand absolutely the position of Mr. Russell, but I have to also uh, underline that within the Polish circumstances, this special issue is uh, much more controversial because of, of the history, because of the neighborhood, because of the Second World War. And still Germany is perceived uh, not in so easy way like it might be perceived by Irish. Uh, I remember when I, when I analyzed, for instance, the, the neutral policy of Ireland during the Second World War and some efforts uh, from, the, from the Nazi Germany towards De Valera and IRA, it uh, still made a completely different picture and different story of the Irish-German relations than, of course, in case of Polish-German relations. It's very 
this is not equivalent and that the, uh, some of the uh, fears or expectations, negative expectations within the Polish public opinion towards the German role is uh, going to be still preserved in my mind, despite the fact that Germany uh, uh, wants to make a certain image as a country which is not ready, of course, to be a predominant one in the EU. However, this sort of skepticism will be definitely much, uh, much stronger within the Polish society than within the Irish. So this is my comment for these uh, words which had ready. As far as the role of the diaspora, yes, you're right if you say, Mabudata, that diaspora is an issue for Poles and for Irish. But frankly speaking, Irish has always been very much important as far as the involvement in the American policy uh, is concerned, uh, having in mind the history. Uh, let's bear in mind that the political involvement of Irish who did not have a capital, but who were very much involved, especially in the activities of the American Democratic Party, uh, it is uh, an interesting evidence to what extent the people of the Irish ancestry were involved, for instance, in the American Party's uh, political machines in large towns. Uh, I also want to add that uh, Irish were always successful in the selection of some of the representatives within the American circumstances to become a lot of mayors of the large towns, especially Chicago or uh, New York, which has never been the chance for polls. Uh, the one funny story from the 20s says that uh, when there was a great competition between Polish and Irish diaspora in Chicago, which resulted finally in the election of the Lord Mayor of this town, uh, not very well known Czech politician, Mr. Czernak, who was the uh, more or less a person acceptable for both large uh, diasporas. And in terms of the statistics, there is about 40 to 45, 44 millions of uh, people of the Irish ancestry in the United States, and there's about 10 millions of Poles in the United States, which means that Irish are much stronger as far as the influence on the American policy is concerned. And it is also well visible in recent 30 to 40 years, when some of the Irish large and important politicians, including especially Ted Kennedy, were involved in the process of stabilization of the political troubles in the Northern Ireland. This was the case, oh, it was an interesting manifestation to what extent the Irish diaspora is strong within the American circumstances. As far as the relations between the EU, EU and United States, definitely, I, I think that in case uh, Donald Trump would become still president for the next uh, four years, these uh, ties between the EU and USA will be much, much weaker. And uh, it will be also the chance for those who were in favor of having Britain outside the EU, because those politicians like Farage, like even Boris Johnson, would be ready to uh, be closer to the United States than to EU. This is my presumption, of course. Although, but we have a Joe Biden now. The but we have a Joe Biden, and Joe Biden, in my mind, Joe, Bi Joe Biden is an intermediary person, and uh, uh, being more, more uh, precise, more sincere, I would say that uh, this politician, who is going to start to begin with his uh, presidential uh, role within the United States, is a person who will uh, who will have also some other important duties to overcome some of the, uh, I wouldn't say conflict, some problematic issues between the EU and United States during the Trump epoch. But he's also a person who is definitely, who will be definitely involved in the, uh, perhaps the revitalization of the American presence in Europe. That is something which in my mind is absolutely inevitable. And the last sentence from my side about that issue lies in the fact that I think that Kamala Harris will be the person who will be rising star within the uh, next administration. So, Mr. Ambassador, uh, you mentioned Joe Biden's influence. The new administration will definitely 
have closer relations with the European Union and maybe a better understanding also of the European Union. But what will be the British plan? I mean, what, what is your expectation about the British-American relations in the long run? Because this was one of the assumptions, you know, that the Brits, uh, well, still want to be close to the European Union, but they really go global. They look globally and they uh, base their future prosperity on this global scale and especially uh, friendship with the US. Well, Britain is a big and important country and it has a long standing friendship with the United States. And I'm sure uh, that that will continue. But I think it's true to say that uh, most professional British diplomats um, would take the view that Britain not being in the European Union does not help them uh, in terms of their influence in, in Washington. For, for a long time, not just because I'm saying it or because of an occasional article, but the fundamental strategy of British foreign policy was to be an active influential member of the European Union and to use that as a base for influence in the United States. So I, I'm sure the relationship between Britain and America will be close and will be friendly. But I think the chances of London being prioritized over uh, Berlin and Paris uh, will have decreased somewhat. I mean, I'm not, I'm not um, celebrating that. I'm not saying it's uh, moving from white to black, but I think most professional British diplomats would, would, would take that view. Uh, I, wish them, I wish them well. But what I would like to say is that it's a, it's a false dichotomy to say, uh, that you know, are people going to be involved in Europe or involved in America, uh, or, or 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 with the Commonwealth? I mean, you can do all of this. Germany exports vastly more to China than the United Kingdom does, and I don't celebrate that. I just state it as a fact. And they do that as a member of the European Union, and they will continue to do that as a member of the European Union. So, Europe for most of us, for Poland and for Ireland, is a way of going global. It's a way of exercising influence in the United States, in the Commonwealth, and everywhere else. Um, Joe Biden is not just Irish, but he's very Irish. Almost every Irish, almost every American president visits his Irish roots. And we, we've had Reagan, Clinton, Bush, Obama, and so on. But Biden um, wears his Irishness on his sleeve. Uh, he's the most Irish president since President Kennedy. And he's uh, also Catholic. He's also a Catholic. Um, we've had, there were many Irish Protestant presidents as well, but... Uh, but for example, when Biden appointed his new transportation secretary a couple of days ago, in his public appearance at the podium to announce it, he said, and my only problem with him is that he comes from Galway rather than Mayo, from one county of Ireland rather than another one. So, you know, he, he really has it in his blood. And um, I, I don't suggest, you know, Ireland, of course, has huge access in Washington. And there's no country except perhaps Israel that, that, that you know, has the same impact for a small country in Washington, and that will absolutely continue and, and probably, uh, probably grow. Um, I, I don't suggest that we carry the overall, if you like, influence of a big country like, like um, the United Kingdom, but uh, the Biden presidency will definitely give us uh, an extra foothold and will be good for Ireland. And the fact that we're members of the European Union will absolutely add to that, because Biden, I'm not saying that he will approach his relationship to Europe through Ireland. Of course not. I mean, he has important countries like Poland and France and Germany to, to do that, uh, and, and Brussels, of course, and, and, and von der Leyen. But the cultural closeness between English-speaking countries is there. Mm -hmm. So I would imagine that when every time he meets the Irish Prime Minister, and he could visit Ireland quite soon, uh, they will talk about Europe amongst other things. And I would imagine he would have a sort of empathetic, relaxed uh, communication on European issues, perhaps to a greater extent than, than any other leader in Europe. So there's another example of where being in the European Union is not an obstacle to going global. It's absolutely um, uh, a necessary step for us and for any country, really. It, and I, I must ask, uh, at this moment, I must ask you also about the security angle, because uh, the agreement reached at uh, uh, Christmas Eve, actually. We can even call it a Christmas agreement, like some journalists announced on the 24th of December is not only about trade. Uh, this is also a set of uh, regulations between the UK and the EU concerning security, uh, cooperation of intelligence. Uh, what, what, what can you say as far as, you know, um, the thing which worries, for example, the Polish people, that the security issue was, was there under Donald Trump. We were not so, you know, comfortable as far as how NATO 
um, was operating. What would you expect as far as this in this triangle, the EU, UK and the US concerning security? Well, I think we should distinguish between uh, defense security and police security, as it were. In, in terms of defense and military security, uh, the British government decided that it did not want that to be dealt with in the agreement reached in December. That was something that the European Union regretted. Uh, we, we, we would have preferred some sort of agreement for arrangements that would involve cooperation in that area between Britain and Europe. But even in the absence of such an agreement, uh, I'm sure that Britain uh, and the European Union in that area uh, will work very closely together, both in NATO, where most of them are members, um, but also in terms of the EU's foreign policy. Uh, and there's no reason to believe, for example, on Iran, uh, you know, Britain uh, is aligning itself with Europe in terms of trying to uh, re-establish uh, the, 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 the nuclear deal which, which Trump walked away from. And when it comes to sanctions against Russia, uh, whenever that is necessary, I'm sure it will work uh, with, with the European Union. Um, Biden, of course, is much more uh, into NATO uh, than Trump was. And he's, if you like, going to restore traditional American policy of absolute commitment to NATO. And that's very valuable for Poland and for, 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 for Europe. And I'm sure that Britain will be absolutely uh, a committed and an important partner, uh, both in NATO and in relations with the European Union in that area. Uh, the question of police cooperation and the fight against crime, uh, there, there has been some uh, agreement in the December agreement, but it doesn't replicate what was there already. There are problems with real time access for the United Kingdom to the necessary databases. There's a question of whether the EU will decide when it reaches a decision, a unilateral decision on this, whether it can pass the data to the United Kingdom. Um, so I'm sure that as in a lot of areas, the, the London government and Brussels and all its member states will work very, very hard to maintain police cooperation. But unfortunately, it won't be at exactly the same level as before. It will be important, it will achieve things, but it will not be as effective as it was. Last question would go to Vavzhenets, because unfortunately our time is almost over. Um, you are also an expert on uh, uh, nationalism as a phenomenon and populist parties. You, you, you also do research on this subject. I just want to ask you um, is, if you can predict you know, the, the, the future for the next decade within the European continent. We still have places like you know, Catalonia, we have uh, Scotland, uh, as we mentioned already in this discussion, that it may be uh, a will of uh, doing another referendum. Now, 55% of Scots um, uh, want a referendum and want independence. That's the opinion polls um, uh, recently published. Uh, would you expect that the, this populistic um, force in the European continent will raise or it will rather uh, you know, change into a let's say, further mobilization towards a deeper integration and going back to the mainstream politics based on, because of pandemic also, which bring us, brings us to the very rational choices. But in the same time, we have a lot of fake news and, uh, uh, you know, theories completely uh, fake about um, everything, about even a vaccination. So do you think the Europeans will go more rational or will go really towards further splits? I mean, whenever the, any national interests are going to this part, it, it means they're not so much rational because quite often they're used, as you said properly, by the populistic-like movements. But on the other hand, there is also the history. History shows us to what extent certain nations were colonized and the others were not. So the issue comes, uh, if you ask about me, me about this question, I think that this is still a, an important basis or sort of the ground for this sort of the movements. Also because of the fact that even within the EU, let's say official ideology of this transnational organization, there was a certain, I wouldn't say sympathy, but it was a sort of the conciliatory approach towards some of the uh, uh, regionalistic or ethno-regionalistic like movements. Uh, please bear in mind the fact that uh, the European Union was oriented and is the structure which is oriented on the, uh, let's say, federalist-like Europe, uh, at least in some of the phases of the existence of this organization. 
which means that the ethno regionalistic movements which were against the nation states in the existing shape, they were called as something which might be included into the Europe of 100 nations. Europe of 100 nations is one of the concepts of the future development of Europe, which is of course not the official ideology of the EU. On the other hand, the ethno-regionalism oriented onto the ethno-national basis, together with the migratory process, migration processes, uh, are remaining in my mind, uh, perhaps the two most important challenges for the internal cohesiveness or integrity of the European Union. We are having right now certain territories. This is Scotland, this is uh, Catalonia, this is Basque Country, this is Flanders, in which you may find a great disagreement for the existing uh, nation states in the uh, current form, which means this challenge is a real one, it exists, and it will be, of course, uh, stronger if the uh, economy of Europe will be weaker. So in my mind, economy is the basis. If economy is okay, then those movements will be definitely less important. If the process will be vice versa, then those movements will be revitalized again. And uh, especially because of the fact that there are very many historical grievances of the smaller nations towards larger nations. This is the issue of the Catalans against Spaniards. This is the issue of Scots uh, against English. This is something which I think is still a sort of the basis for the uh, certain troubles which may become and which may be visible in the future of Europe. Uh, gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. Uh, well, in front of us, a very interesting but difficult decade for the European Union, uh, for sure. But uh, let's hope pandemic is something which is very bad, but it's much better than a war. So maybe we'll find out the way for the new century to reorganize ourselves within the European Union, because this concept worked quite well for all of us. Uh, thank you very much for your time, Bobby McDonough. Uh, thank you, Bobby. Uh, thank you. And Wawrzyniec Konarski, Professor Wawrzyniec Konarski, thank you very much, Wawrzyniec. Thank you, too. Uh, and I hope uh, we will um, see you again every Tuesday, 5 o'clock Polish time at our Facebook profile, Center for International Relations. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye.